will record the the webinar and a recording will be made available afterwards. So if you are communicating, um, asking questions and things, just be mindful that it will be recorded and shared after the fact. Uh, but welcome. I'm really happy to be able to provide a bit of an introduction to protocols.io today. Um, because it's hard to know what level of familiarity people have with protocols.io, I am going to do very broad um, overview, but please feel free to ask specific questions um, along the way in the Q&A, and I'll get to them at the end. I'm unlikely, I think, to be able to monitor them at the same time as I run through. By way of introducing myself, my name is Emma Ganley, uh, Director of Strategic Initiatives at Protocols.io. We are quite a small team, so we all share around doing these webinars um, and providing training to new users and more advanced users. Um, my background was a researcher, scientist, with PhD and postdoc, and then I actually moved into editorial work. So I worked as a scientific editor for a little over 15 years. So my recent, most recent position in editorial work before joining protocols.io was as chief editor at PLOS Biology, Public Library of Science Biology. So I have thought a lot about publishing research outputs, and making papers open access, data open access, uh, and now methods too. Uh, but as you will see, Protocols.io is a tool very much for private development of content as well as public sharing of content. So with that, uh, a few quick housekeeping points. Uh, for those who are just joining, we are recording the webinar. Everyone who has registered will receive a link to the recording and these slides after the fact. There is, if you didn't spot um, when you signed up for this webinar, there are often other webinars being um, made available that cover different elements, some are slightly more advanced, so you may want to check those out and see if you want to sign up for any others. But if you start using protocols.io and have more specific questions or um, use cases and scenarios that you're not sure what you need to do or you're just struggling to get started, you can sign up for a one-to-one -one demo or a demo slot that you join with a couple of your colleagues. So please feel free to do that. And as I noted, Q&A will be at the end. So please add questions to the Q&A, which is not disabled, although the chat is apologies for that. So feel free to pop in questions uh, and I'll run through them at the end. Okay, so we're at five after, so I'm gonna properly get started even though I think some attendees are still just joining, but hopefully people will catch up later. So just a brief agenda. Start with a bit of context around why sharing math methods matters, uh, and then we'll go into a bit more of an introduction of protocols.io, the mission of the company, and the key functionality that is offered. I will run through um, quite a high level how to navigate through protocols.io, the fact that there's public repository, but that also it's very much a tool for creation and sharing of protocols, both privately among yourselves before you choose or maybe don't choose to make them public eventually. But I will cover how to publish and make your protocols more available publicly. Uh, and also, if those some of you aren't aware, we have a protocol entry service too. So if you do struggle to get started using or using our service for a first protocol, can be a good way for you to see how you would put one of your protocols into protocols.io. But hopefully, there'll be plenty of time for Q and A at the end as well. So why sharing methods matters. Uh, we often give these introductions about the fact that many people in research struggle to find detailed information about the protocols that other researchers have previously used to perform specific uh, research. So within research papers, there is often not enough information for an experiment to be repeated or to know exactly what those researchers did. So this tweet 
is from a biologist who looks for a protocol in an earlier paper, which was as described in another earlier paper, which bounces to another earlier paper. Um, this is very common and very frustrating, and researchers are actually just unable to get access to and be able to replicate those experiments. Often you might expect that the information would be in lab notebooks from say a previous postdoc or somebody, but unfortunately even those are pretty unreliable. So what we often find is that your notebooks, previous notebooks have been lost. Um, it's a great source of frustration. Uh, we just don't know what the method was. This is also the case internally within some groups though. So it may be that you want to repeat something that a postdoc did from a a paper in the lab that you're currently working in or another researcher did as part of a previous um, approach just a year ago and it may well be that you actually already don't have enough information remaining in the lab to repeat that. It's not just uh, limited to life sciences and biology, this is a tweet from a physicist who was looking to understand how specific devices were fabricated and hit exactly the same problem. And the original reference on this one is that devices were fabricated with conventional methods. But if we think about that in the context of own research group too, you know, commonly you will be your own most likely future collaborator. So organizing your own content for your own edification in the future is very important. Um, there have been initiatives that have tried to reproduce specific um, areas of research. So the cancer biology, Reproducibility project was carried out by the Open Science Framework, um, and their goal of this project was to try and replicate the experiments from 50 published, quite high profile cancer biology papers. Um, and there's a lovely write up about this experiment in The Atlantic, uh, written by Ed Young. And there's an excerpt here, so I'll pick out some of those bolded parts which you know the hardest part by far was figuring out exactly what the original labs actually did. Uh, often the recipes that you would expect as methods paper, method sections in papers are incomplete, missing out important steps, details or ingredients and in some cases the recipes aren't described at all. So they looked at the papers, they also contacted the authors and unfortunately it was not possible to retrieve information as to how to replicate the experiments and the protocols. And so despite wanting to replicate 50 papers, they stopped after just 18 because it was financially and from a time perspective, just much too expensive to try and do this uh, where they were really not unable to replicate the experiments. Um, and we might wonder, do you know, does methods matter for reproducible research? I have my, as we do the virtual trainings, the cookies that we might have enjoyed where we all in a room together. This image came from a magazine where someone had baked many different cookies and had implemented tiny changes to the recipe that they used and the approach that they used. And so if cookies are the resulting data, we can only understand and analyze the phenotypes, the resulting phenotypes of the data, size, thickness, texture, etc. We can only really understand what they mean if we know exactly what the method was that was used and understand the tweaks that were made to that recipe. So I think it's worth thinking about if you're taking time to share data, and a lot of people do do this now, it's probably very important to provide information about the methods that were used to generate the data at the same time. There's a lovely quote from uh, an evolutionary biologist from the 70s, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Uh, and I have tweaked that. <laughs> and so I like to say nothing in research data makes sense except in light of how it was generated. So whether you're... Um, making all of your data publicly available, or you're just trying to keep it in the lab and interpret and analyze, it's absolutely critical to understand for each time you generate data, what happened as the method that was used to generate the data. And the more detail, the better for that, in fact. Um, so that leads me to protocols.io. 
So we are a tool that has a very simple mission. We want to make it easy to share method details before, during, and after publication. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of people know of protocols.io as an open access repository, and it's absolutely correct that many people publish and make available protocols publicly on protocols.io. I think the part which is less well appreciated is the before and during of this of this mission statement, because it's very much about allowing researchers to keep notes on the protocols as they develop them, as researchers use and repeat experiments and tweak and optimize. Uh, it is the place where you can store all of that information as a protocol or a method evolves, and you can also record all of the runs of the experiments when you go through them. So you will have timestamped run records that can be correlated to the data that you've generated on any given day. It can be used across all different research disciplines. Initially, um, it was created, the founder Lenny Tatelman was a molecular biologist, or geneticist, uh, and he felt compelled to do this after struggling to replicate some protocols during his postdoc actually. So initially at launch, it had more of a life sciences wet lab um, remit in mind, but it has since been used across all different research disciplines, all the way through to you know social sciences, um, medical approaches, public health. It's, it's very uh, versatile, really with a bare kind of template structure that it has, can be adapted to present information about any method that you have that follows a step-by-step -step process, so regardless of the research discipline. It has a lot of wonderful collaborative tools that mean even if you're not geographically co-located, you can work on these methods with your, with your colleagues and peers um, across all different labs, different spaces, and you can feed back and give information to one another. Contents are archived and mirrored, um, and as you can see, although there's, you know, about 13,000 public protocols, which is that open access repository side, there's a lot more private content, um, and this is growing rapidly as it's used for development of methods along the way. So I think just to frame the benefits that using a tool like protocols.io can bring is that it can allow you to manage and share research data and protocols together. So we don't we don't replace an electronic lab notebook, but we do we actually have integrations with three and growing numbers all the time. So I think that they're very complementary to one another. That's a common question we have is you know what's the difference with an electronic lab notebook or research notebook? They're very complementary. The protocols.io really gives you this templated structure for methods. The electronic lab notebook is more of that kind of day-to-day, -day, all of the other things and the structuring of perhaps the higher level um, approaches that you're taking. <coughs> but you can copy the two together and keep track of which experiments you performed on which days and anything that happened during a specific run. Um, if used appropriately, in kind of day to day it can really simplify teamwork and improve collaboration because you'll have uh, within a team, you can share the content together. Um, you will all be able to see which are the latest versions of a protocol and make sure that you're all referring to the right versions and collaboratively edit or feedback on those protocols as they evolve over time. Uh, and again, theoretically, if you're using this right, it really can save time and help you keep all of your work organized. We've heard some horror stories about how protocols, different versions get dumped in a big Google Drive somewhere <laughs> out in the ether within you know, very um, prestigious labs. So this is a way to help you as a team, whatever the structure of the team or collaboration, to keep the content centrally and make sure you all know which versions you're using or should be using uh, and track the evolution over time. So I will switch now and talk very specifically about protocols.io and some of how you would navigate through. Um, I mentioned that you can, that there's kind of a public and a private element. There are also two different really main kinds of um, accounts that you can have. So there's a very basic 
free account, which absolutely anyone can sign up for. Um, and it allows you to have up to five private protocols and you can always publish as many as you like for free. So if you continually develop and publish, you'll continually be allowed to have additional private because they'll convert to public at some point or another. Um, but they are limited to five. Then there are premium workspaces. And so that has you know, enhanced security, um, more you can have unlimited number of private and the workspaces. Workspaces is really a location to share the content with other people and additional tech support and things like this. But I'm not, I'm really not gonna dwell on that today. I'll just talk through basic functionality uh, that anyone could have with a free account. So when you use protocols.io, you will come in initially once you've signed into a file manager for a workspace. You may have joined a workspace that someone else has set up and invited you to, or you may create your own workspace. And the file man manager you'll see in a moment is exactly what it sounds like, is the kind of location where you can create structure, um, folders and put files and just keep them in some kind of order that you choose. The profile is a more general view of that same workspace, um, which allows you to track things that have happened over time, see how many other members there are. So this is more useful if it's a bigger group that are all a part of a common workspace. <clears throat> when you create these workspaces, you can choose whether you want them to be essentially invisible to anyone else <laughs> outside of the people who you choose to invite into that workspace or publicly visible uh, and open for anyone to join. So you have all the controls to decide how you want that to be set up. So, you know, most commonly, probably within a collaborative research group, it may very well be invisible and you've controlled exactly who can join that workspace um, and invited them specifically. And then there's the editor, which is the place where you will create individual protocols. So I'll show examples of all of these together. So the file manager, you can literally drag drop files into here from your workspace. So if you're not quite ready to start using protocols.io to generate all of the protocols, but you have them somewhere scattered on your hard drive as PDFs or Word documents, you can drag the files in here and at least store them somewhere um, centrally with a view to hopefully improving how they're, how they're presented afterwards. Um, so you can use this archiving your own content, auditing and exporting. Once you have content in here that you've generated as a part of protocols.io, you can export out very easily and connect to a bunch of different external locations, drives, OneDrive box, Dropbox, OSF, Lab Archives is an electronic lab notebook that you can push content to. Um, and there's a lot of security and backup functionality that comes once you put content in here. So this is a view of just a demo space that I have set up, which can help you see a little bit how you can structure. So maybe I've got a folder of protocol files to import where I've just dragged and dropped things from my uh, hard drive that I want to get into protocols.io, but I don't have the time just now. Maybe I have some protocols that I'm developing. Maybe I've got some that are really working well and I may have published some or I may have them deliberately unpublished because they're just for my group to be using. And when I run my protocols, perhaps I want to store my run records somewhere very specifically so I can track those individually. And perhaps I've got files that I'm deliberately intending to export out to my electronic lab notebook. So you can set this up however you like. Within a workspace, if you have other members, um, they will all see this top level Emma's workspace here, but they every member will have um, a file as well that is their username and has the protocols.io raccoon. That folder is private only to that person. So if I had files in here that I wasn't ready to share with the rest of my workspace, my, my team, I don't want them to see them yet. It's something really new. I'm not ready. I want to make sure it works before I share it. I can develop that in this Emma Ganley folder and keep it private just to myself uh, until I'm ready to share it more widely. Um, 
Okay, and then I mentioned the profile. So you can go from workspaces. When you look at protocols.io, you will have this view on the left hand side. Each, oops, excuse me, that's jumping around. Each of the um, I, icons, my mouse has become <laughs> hair trigger sensitive. Each of the icons on the left are individual workspaces that I belong to. So this pink E is Emma's workspace, the one that I was just in. And if I click across, it will expand out. So actually I can see a bit more information about each of these workspaces. And I can see if they're, they're public with the globe or private with the badge um, at this point in time as well. And if I click the arrow at the right, it gives me a drop down with several different additional options to see for this workspace. And this is where I can jump across to the profile view. And so there's not actually that much in this. It's really a demo workspace I have, but you can at least see within the profile that there's a timeline, publications will show, the number of members, who else is in there. You can also add discussions, resources, news. So you can imagine if you're using this with your direct collaborators on a specific project, you can add links to resources or news items or seed discussions with your colleagues about those protocols, about other things that you're working on um, in the workspace to keep all that content nicely together. And just to illustrate how that looks for a, an actual real workspace that's been widely used, we set up a public coronavirus method development community for, I would imagine, fairly obvious reasons at this point in time, um, at the start of 2020. It all, this was a very public open for anyone to join workspace. Um, and organically grew very rapidly actually to have, I think more than this even now, I'm not sure when I took this screenshot, but oh, you know, oh, in excess of 350 members. And when you look at the profile on a workspace like this, there's a lot more content that you can look through. Um, and you can sort by most viewed, um, other different metrics like the dates, so you can see most recent, most viewed, et cetera, et cetera. You can add categories to these. So I think if I had this um, to toggle down, you would see public health sequencing, different categories. So you can organize the content in there a little bit more. And you can see here that there've been quite a few discussions and resources and news items added. So this then becomes a very useful communication platform for questions, discussions, resources around the specific topic of the workspace and the and the methods that people are sharing here. I showed you when you click on the left, you can have access to a lot of other options. So you can get to these as well from the profile by clicking workspace settings. And then if you just look through, this is where as the administrator, you can toggle and change the various settings, the accessibility, the rights of the members in the workspace. You can stop them from publishing. You can allow them to publish. You can give them more rights. You can make them co-administrator um, and, and just set it up exactly how you want to um, for that collaboration. Here is so here's some of the things that you would see. It's where you can change the visibility settings. So when you make the workspace, you might initially choose to have it private, but over time, perhaps you think maybe I would quite like that to now be public. You can change these later if you want. You can change how members can join. Uh, can anybody join or can they request to join and I can still control whether I let them or not or do they have to have a very specific invitation? Um, so there's a lot of configurability that you can use. You can invite people by email. You can have a link just to give to you know, a whole big group of people. They can all follow the link and, and join if you want them to be able to do so. I mentioned that you can export protocols and run records. So this is incredibly easy. If you have a protocol, uh, this is part of the view you will see when you're in there um, editing it. There's a more and you can find the export and follow the options here. Similarly, if you're in the file manager, you can select whichever files you want to. And on the right hand side, there are options that will show up. So you can do a lot of things here. So this just highlights that 
integration with Lab Archives, the electronic lab notebook. So we have a push integration with that notebook, but we also have integrations with both RSpace and Sinote, but they're more pull. So from your RSpace or Sinote account, you can pull content from protocols.io. Um, and I haven't really shown you a protocol yet, but when, once you've signed in, it is very simple. Within your workspace, you'll see new and a plus at the top, and it will give you options. So you can create a protocol here. You can also create documents. And collection is when you want, once you've made several protocols, you can put them all into a collection. So if for some higher level project, you know there are five separate protocols that will be followed, you could put them all in separately and then add those into a collection. You say, yes, I want a new protocol and you'll choose where you would like to create that in your workspace if you've added structure. Um, and you then get a choice of various different types and categories. This doesn't really impact any of the functionality in the editor. It just tries to present to you the most likely components that you will want to use if it's more of a biology life sciences protocol or it's more of a chemistry protocol, et cetera. Um, we're expanding how we present this so it looks more inclusive because we, it looks a little restrictive now at this point in time. <clears throat> and this is the editor. So this is what you see once you've generated a new protocol. Well, it won't have any content in it yet, but it will be very, very easy for you to add a step. Um, the editor toolbar along the top is very intuitive. So really you'll just come and have a play around. You can add step, you can add sections. When you put sections, they receive color codes. Um, down the left hand side, and there will also be a table of contents that's generated from that. So if it's a, a kind of multi multi different process protocol that has different sections that make sense, you can break that out much more easily this way. Um, these are the components that we encourage you to use. So when you add something as a component, like the 200 mil here, that's done with the amount component. Um, and this is the a duration. So you have a timer. Um, when you do this correctly, at the end, you would end up with the timer elements being reflected for the duration of the protocol. The quantities, if you're doing a master mix of some kind, you can scale those if you run the protocol. So if you have Kind of a recipe for a certain volume of master mix, but you would like to scale that up two or threefold, you can do that when you run the protocol and it will be very obvious in the run record what you did and how much you created. These are these kind of critical steps show you there's a pause here. Um, I'm centrifuging here, I'm pipetting. So at a, at a glance, you can see more readily what steps are coming up. Um, and you can include citations, data sets, all sorts of different things and play around. So the, the components that you see will change slightly depending on the biology or chemistry or comp computational type of protocol at the start that you pick, but you can switch between them um, and select any of the components and use them at any time. There's a granular editing history, so you can see what's happened before. That's a little bit limited if you have a free account, but it's you, it's comprehensive and you can go back as far as you like if you have the premium accounts. Um, concurrent editing, very much like a Google document. You can see my little icon here. So I'm in here editing. If I'd shared this protocol with a colleague um, and they were editing it at the same time, you would see their icon as well. Um, there are these other tabs, so that was steps, but there's also description. We will require an abstract if you want to publish a protocol because they're indexed. Uh, you don't have to otherwise. You can place images in. Um, adding this kind of content makes it perhaps easier to look through your protocols at a later stage or search across them to find specific ones that you're looking for. So generally, we'd encourage you to add as much information as possible to aid with discoverability. 
if you're collaborating with your team, you know, the keywords about the experiment, the specific cells or equipment you're using can help your collaborators or even you search back against content that you've created to find uh, uh, the protocols that are relevant in this instance. If it's linked to a published article, you can place that manuscript citation in here as well, and that will show up on a published protocol at that point in time. Um, you can, well, you should be attributing an image if you've put someone, put one in, um, and you can add a disclaimer if there's kind of a public health implication or some other relevant information and funder info. As you go further across those tabs, there's guidelines and warnings, various different things you can fill in, and materials. When you go through the materials, you can use the reagents component and really include a lot of detailed information like catalog numbers, um, vendor specifics of reagents, materials or equipment that you're using that can really help others to know exactly what you did when you performed experiments. Um, within the protocols themselves, because this isn't a static, very basic narrative that you would normally see as somebody writing up as part of materials and methods, you can put a lot more dynamic content in here. So you can add images or movies. And again, they're very easy to find the places to do this on the toolbar of the editor. There's just to add an image or a video. You can put a video directly in, but it has a size limit. And the way that works slightly better if you're putting a video in is if you can already have it on YouTube or something equivalent, and then find the embed code for that video and place that directly into the protocols.io editor, and it will pull them in. These have been put in from YouTube. So once you find the embed code, so on YouTube, you click share and it will give you the option to choose embed code. But um, I think that all the other kind of movie places where you can upload content have a similar mechanism to do that. Sharing, posting and publishing protocols, which keep an eye on the time. Um, so when you're in the, you've created your protocol, you've gone from edit mode and you're viewing it now. Um, <clears throat> there are options here to publish, reserve DOI, post a draft and peer review options, share and run. Um, encourage you if you're using to just click on those and see a little bit more how they work. But it, in very brief, publish will take you through a very short process and will provide you with a DOI, a digital object identifier for your protocol. Um, so <clears throat> excuse me, you can then put that DOI link into a research manuscript to, to make for a much more comprehensive, comprehensive materials and methods for that, for that paper. Reserve DOI is a way to know the link that you will have the DOI when you choose to fully make it public, but it will also give you a private link so you can share with editors, reviewers, other people, um, for the review process if that's the way that you want to do things. Like we would always encourage if you're going to publish it that you publish it straight away, but some people would rather keep it private until corresponding paper is published. Post-draft is, it will make it public, you can share with anyone publicly, but it won't have a digital object identifier, there'll be no DOI created for that. Peer review options gives you a bit of information about um, a collaborative effort we have with PLOS One, whereby they have a new article type. I think I have a slide in a moment called a lab protocol. Um, and you can publish essentially a short method paper where there is um, introduction, abstract, etc., as you would normally expect in a research article. But the materials and methods has to be a protocol or a collection of protocols on protocols.io. Share is where you can um very selectively choose if you want to share with colleagues you can share by email share with a whole workspace um you can share with other users but that the email functionality means you can actually send a private link to someone who doesn't even have 
an account on protocols.io, they won't be able to interact in the same way as a user will, but they will be able to view what you've done and give you feedback in whichever way you choose. And then run when you're viewing, this is where you can start a run of a protocol and record that run record. So there's a lovely functionality to add comments to protocols. So you can do this on either private or public protocols. So even before you've published, as you develop this with colleagues or you're working on something and you need some feedback from someone else in your group, you can add comments and respond to comments together on the protocol, either at the level of the whole protocol or on individual steps. Um, and when you add a comment, the person who's creating the protocol will receive an alert about the comment that's been added. So they get a prompt to look at that information. And um, when this happens on a public protocol, it becomes really like a, like a very dynamic and um, evolving public FAQ on a protocol. So this is a, a very well accessed protocol that's been published a while back, cut and run by um, Professor Stephen Hennikoff. And as you can see, this is one version of one <laughs> instance of this protocol, which has evolved many times. And there are 123 comments. And so, you know, Marie here has come in with a comment to the authors. And Derek Janssen's, he's one of the authors who's published subsequent versions of this protocol, who's answered the question here. Um, and anyone can come and ask these questions if they have an account on protocols.io. They can choose whether it's public or they can select to keep it private if they want to. Um, this is just how to show what you how you can place a DOI into a materials and methods section of an article. So this was a PLOS biology paper that was published and contained um, a collection, a link to a collection of protocols that the authors had put onto protocols.io. And so when you look at the materials and methods section, literally just get the link. There is a bit of information still in there, but it links to a very comprehensive series of all of those protocols together. And if you follow that link, you come to protocols.io. And what's really lovely about this is that the authors can subsequently make updates to the protocols in the collection if they want to do so. That version in the paper will always point to this version one or whichever version they've pointed to when they published it. But if they've since updated anything in that collection, the viewer will be alerted that there's a newer version available. And they can take a look at that instead. And there'll be a way to see what's been updated between those versions. Um, and what this means is if they catch mistakes or someone can't get something to repeat and a step needs a bit more clarification, um, the authors can make an update and they don't have to go back to the journal for any kind of formal correction or anything like that. So it's a pretty powerful way of um, recognizing that methods are really very dynamic and evolving. Um, it may be that they've published, but they, afterwards they buy a new piece of equipment and they would like people to know how to do that experiment with the new kit, because that's now how they do it in their lab. Um, they would be able to do that by making a new version as well. This is just to show that partnership of the lab protocol article in PLOS One. So it's a lab protocol. It looks like any other PLOS One article, except it has a very prominent link to see the protocol. And in the materials and methods, there's a very clear link to where the methods are. Um, and then there's a lovely bi-directional link between the paper and the protocol and protocols that I owe. This just shows you it's not just life sciences um, wet lab research because this is an archaeology paper around kind of illustrations for archaeology. Um, the one of the other big benefits of separating out method from research paper is that you can facilitate some amazing cross-disciplinary connections. So on the top left here was a tweet from a researcher in Chile who was looking for RNA extraction methodology um, and they're working on primary cortical neuron cultures, so kind of brain cells. Um, there were a few tweets and down the line somebody suggested this protocol for RNA extraction. Uh, and when we looked at this methodology, it actually came from a paper about 
uh, three spine stickleback parasite, so a fish parasite. In fact, the, the protocol itself is about extracting from flatworms. So uh, we've got someone looking for a method for brain cells <laughs> who's been pointed to a paper on uh, fish parasites and the methodology for flatworms. But the, the method itself is distinct um, and, and very applicable across multiple different model organisms. So it makes a lot of sense in a way that by separating out the method, you really can increase these cross-disciplinary connections. The, the methods are much more widely applicable in, in a lot of cases. So you can increase the discoverability and reproducibility and just generally enhance the value of the method de development itself. We see people use it for teaching, which is really nice as well. Um, you can set up a class protocol for people to follow on protocols.io, or you can have researchers write up um, experimental protocols on protocols.io. We include a lot of more detailed information on here. Um, I won't go into this in great detail, but it's just to kind of highlight the, the versatility of the tool. Um, people may not be familiar because I think <laughs> we've noticed that oftentimes researchers are not necessarily reading all the fine print in the instructions to authors, but you will find that over 500 journals uh, and publishers recommend that authors use protocols.io as a location to provide much more comprehensive methods details. There are also quite a few funders who recommend protocols.io in their grant guidelines and policies. Um, and more and more institutions are subscribing to site licenses, which gives you that premium access that I mentioned earlier. Um, so there's a way to check if your organization has a site license. And I mentioned a bit earlier the extra benefits that that has, but there's a drop down on this page. So it may be that you want to take a look. And if they don't and you start using it and you think that it's a valuable tool, then you should. Um, you can contact us and we have suggestions of how to approach people at your organization. Uh, and finally, I mentioned the protocol import service. So we offer for a fee. Um, at, well, if you have a premium license, you may be, this may be partly included, but if not, there's a fee. Um, it's not too expensive. If you have a protocol in a different format that you would like to get into protocols.io, but the for whatever reason, the activation energy or time needed for you or someone in your lab to do that is, is missing presently, um, you could use our import service. And it's a good way to get a protocol in. You would have to then have an account so that we could transfer it back to you. You could check what had been, what had been imported and make sure you were happy with it. Um, and then we would transfer the ownership back to you. And it can be a very good way of just starting to use the platform um, and get get your feet wet with it um, and see how it works, see how your methods can look on the platform. And I think that's pretty much everything I was going to cover. So we have still got some time for q and I'll pop these links up here um, and jump over to the Q&A to see if we have things there, but please feel free to add any other questions you have. Um, I can stay on for a little while, so we can we can continue on. Uh, so the first few things were, um, I think, already taken care of. That was just that the chat was disabled. Um, Andreas, will reagents or consumables be maintained within protocols.io, or is there any kind of import function or interface to take over those data from other systems? So that is a really good question. Um, we have not really maintained within protocols. We do communicate with vendors when they have new catalogs so that we can import um, information about content that's in those catalogs. With um, clients, we could probably discuss uh, if there's a way to import content, if you already have existing um, kind of libraries of reagents or consumables that you wanted to get into protocols.io. Um, but within a workspace, what I didn't show is there's a place to keep um, a reagent library where you can monitor 
actually exactly where content is in a lab. So like it's on the top shelf on the left hand side. You can literally put that much information and track when things were purchased um, and when you think it will need to be reordered um, and so on and keep a much larger library of content in there. Um, but it that would need a dedicated effort and discussion probably. We don't have anything ready to go to import content like that. Um, let's see, what would be possible if you choose to use an institutional account to get premium access and then move institution, what happens to your protocols that aren't public? So we will never take your protocols away from you. Um, but if you move institution and have to update your email address to the new location, what will happen is that if you have maxed out the five free, say you've got um, 10 or 20 private protocols at that time, they will stay there. You will just not be able to make any additional private protocols unless um, you, you manage to persuade your new institution or you take out, there are individual um, premium accounts that we offer as well. It's generally much more cost effective for an institutional one. Um, it's not really much more than a few open access publication charges for an institution to subscribe for, you know, hundreds of researchers in their institution if it's an academic institution. So the best bet would be to try and persuade a new place to subscribe for you. But we would never delete content. I think that's the key thing. And you could export them if you wanted um, to move them off if they were all private. And then you would be able to create more again up to five. Well, I am very, very happy to take follow up questions um, at a later day. And as I've got the one on one demo link here as well, I can see we've got another question. Seems to me that protocols that IO is highly specialized to natural sciences. See terms like reagents, duration, et cetera, which I suppose makes sense in such research fields. Do you think it can be profitably used in other fields like computer science, for example, protocol may be used to describe the experiment design a machine learning application, but this may require different terminology, e.g. metrics, statistical tests, etc. While some features may be of little use, but in very special cases, e.g. duration once been used. So I have not done a very good job of showing you the versatility of the tool, but one of those options when you make a new protocol is actually for a computational um, protocol. And it's clearly not a replacement for GitHub. So it's not really the place where you would write code, but if you have computational workflows um, and you want to give a very more detailed kind of readme file for how to undertake computational processes, um, it absolutely can work for that purpose. And if you select um, computational as the protocol type at the start, um, you will see that you are probably not seeing the same component. So you won't be seeing reagents and things like this. You'll be seeing data sets or um, I can't remember what they are off the top of my head, but they're, they're, they're slightly different, the ones that you would see. Um, so it, it, can, it can very much be used for that purpose too. Um, as I say, it's not a replacement for GitHub, but it's very useful for workflows and pipelines um, and snippets of code for when you're actually running through um, a computational workflow. Hopefully that answers the question. You're welcome, you're welcome. That's great. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, I'll just sit for a little bit longer because I know typing in the questions is not always completely um, as quick and speedy as you'd like it to be. Uh, but please do send follow up questions sign up for an account if you haven't and try out and feel free to book a demo there are i'm pretty much the only member on the on uk time um which works better for i think the people who have joined today there are some slots each week on 
at times that should work for people here today. Uh, it is more slanted towards people in America because that's where we have slightly more uh, team members based. But um, if you contacted me, I would be happy to set up a one-to-one -one with someone if they have specific questions. So please do feel free. That's great, thank you. I will stop the recording.